coffee. So when you go fast, you have a slight double D after the O, just very naturally. Non credo you know? del mio, o del mio cor dolce desio. And you don't even you don't even think about it. It just happens. <laughs> you know I don't hear it. Yeah, I, it's funny, I, right? I know it is supposed to be there because I know the theory. I know. I have learned it. <laughs> But I don't hear. It's the funniest thing, too, right? Because that's what I tell people. When, when, when I coach people, I say, they're not aware of this when they say it, right? And they will actually argue with me, you know, that it's not there. And then they'll, they'll go, look, and they'll say it, and they'll do it. You know, it. It always happened this way. But the danger for us, if we're not native speakers, is to exaggerate. And then it becomes vulgar. So to... For the big trick for everybody in the world is to capture the naturalness of that double D. And you see, you know, when they're looking at our text that we've written out in the description, I have printed that as a double D. But the, you know, the, the thing is, is that they should, they need to, they need to copy what you do in your naturalness when you, when you do it, how small it is. If it is useful to know that, and if thinking of that very position of the consonant makes a phrasing double, it's okay. The fact that I don't hear it is just, this, this is not a problem. I mean, it's just a, a fact. I mean, I don't hear it. I understand that it is that moment of silence that makes the double. And I know it because we've been talking about it many times. Um, the thing I wanted to add just uh, shortly is that mm, I happen to have a couple of teachers uh, that really uh, were into this subject of diction, especially one, the last one, Ercilia Colonna. She's a very good teacher. And um, when I uh, used to attend those lessons as a student, I was taught not to double. So. The effort was not to emphasize doubles, just the real doubles. So now the hard time for me is to see that there are doubles that are written and not to do them too much. So we try not to double because when we speak, sometimes we do. To emphasize a, a sentence, it's or it is probably in our own accent. Or <laughs> my father is Sardinian, so you can imagine. I don't know if you know how it sounds, but it all there are many doubles there. Or in Liguria, where I was born and grew up, uh, we. We, we don't double where it is supposed to be doubled. So it is very confusing. We learn doubles when we learn how, um, how to write in Italian at school. Well, here's, here's my question though. In what, in, you know, in what case was it that you were doubling too much? You know, for instance, some people double after the word la, and then it's not correct because the la is supposed, in, in, you know, in, in stage Italian, that the word la is supposed to be a weak monosyllable, or after li, or lo, or le, you right? Know, when you sing and you or. are Italian, 
who are not supposed to think about strong monosyllables or weak monosyllables. I mean, you you probably do. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree with you on that. But I'm, I'm saying about even the ones like a, a double T in the word toothful, right? What you you could you could have ex you know my my question is did was that just being exaggerated? And that's why you get the note you're doubling too much and it, it doesn't sound elegant. There are all kinds of there are all kinds of nuances to over doubling something. If I read this sentence. Uh, and I just don't care about being elegant. I can say, non credo del mio cor dolce desio. I can say that. I don't like it, but I can say that. Um, if I want to sing and I want to read it properly, I try not to do it. Absolutely not. So I try to do, non credi o del mio cor dolce desio. It, and I didn't do it, in my opinion. But the second one would be the one that any careful coach would go for in the singing. Yes. So I think we agree on that, right? That the second one you did had doublings. See, so two things can be true. Two things can be true at the same time. You can double consonants and you can do it elegantly. And, or you could double consonants and you could be vulgar. So you see what I mean? The, the thing is that, that the nuance of it is that two things can be true at the same time. Yes. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. You don't have to leave out all the doubles in order to be elegant. Because again, this is the whole point of these videos. What is the difference between speaking and singing? And it's very interesting to, to discover the things that it, how Italians have to think about it versus not native speakers. You know, the funny thing is that I am not the Italians. I am myself. I am just one person. The very important thing is that singers, young singers, people who absolutely know nothing about it, how to speak Italian, uh, know how the language sounds. It is very different when then you sing. So we can try and help them a little bit, but as Italians, when we learn diction or when we learn how to sing and our teachers are very good about diction, about, um, about how to pronounce the words, they make us concentrate on the vowels. So, for example, to avoid uh, the tutto, we work on the U, to, to, of course. Yeah, yeah and So the consonants are not a problem if we pronounce them. If we don't pronounce, the problem is that an Italian speaking fast often doesn't doesn't pronounce properly the consonants. So uh, so you understand nothing because we are all singing on vowels and that's it. You don't hear vowel, um, consonants. So. We have to work on it. So that's why sometimes you tell me, read this sentence, and I roll R's very much. Because uh, even if they are not supposed to be so much rolled, but I do it because I have learned that I have to pronounce uh, more the consonants. And if I don't, don't do that, it is impossible to understand what I do. So in, in a way, sometimes we do exaggerate certain things when we learn um, diction, and then we have to go back to a good pronunciation. When we are we have practice articulation, then we go back to a good pronunciation, to a proper, elegant pronunciation. But um, the phrasing double, I'm, I am also reading what Evelina Colorni says, and I see that she's dealing with the difference between speaking and singing a lot. So it's very interesting because here I'm not speaking to Italians. <laughs> also, yes, she, but she was also in the United States. She was in New York. She was in Juilliard and she dealt mainly with non-native speakers. So it was basically uh, preparing people for those Toscanini recordings of opera, right? And Robert Shaw Corral was the opera chorus. So they delved very, very deeply into those details, and then she figured out a way to write, write it all down. So it was very, very, you know, she was actually a pioneer in how to teach 
non-native speakers, she's probably one of the first coaches to really have to produce at such a high level. As she claims, and uh, please tell me if I'm wrong, she claims that she is doing this for English people. Yes. English people, which is something, because French people have other needs or around the world there are many uh, different uh, difficulties for example spanish or uh, hispano uh, speakers they have other kind of problems they don't of course they don't have the problem of the r but, <laughs> or vowels we have very similar vowels but they have different consonants so i mean um, uh, it's very interesting that she's doing it for english speaking people because it is very focused on your pronunciation and it is very important because uh, this kind of work has to be very precise, I think. Paolo Zedda, for example, used to do it, of course, for French people because he used to live in Paris and, and work for, for French students, but he used to do it also, also for German, I know it is. So uh, we, we have to, to think that there are many languages that would need that, but uh, exactly, uh, focus on their own sounds and uh, problems then we can generalize a little bit but mm, of course it is very specific you know mm. yes yeah but, you know they, they, it, you bring up an interesting point because in um, new york when i was in new york the amount of uh, foreign also non-american singers there, there were more foreign singers in new york than anywhere in the world and in fact Um, there, there was a time even at the turn of the century in, in New York, there were more Irish people in New York. The only place there were more Irish people were Belfast. The only more, you know, the only people where there were more Italian people were, were, was Rome or, you know, it was, it's amazing. And you can go through every single ethnicity. So um, in New York, you do have lots of French clients, Italian clients, German clients, uh, people from all over Asia. Uh, it's it's pretty amazing, and you do have to adapt your style depending on what their the, the native uh, the, the native tongue of that person is. Uh, you've made it to the end of another video, and you if you feel you've benefited from our work and we've saved you uh, a lot of money, un sacco di soldi, why not head over to Patreon or subscribe star to support our work? Then you may donate as little as a couple dollars a month and your support is appreciated. YouTube is now um, propping up corporate channels and not small channels like us. So the best thing you can do is share, like the videos and tell your friends and subscribe. Um, so also uh, head over to Alina's channel, Alina Vila, uh, or my channel, John Mario. And there, we have other videos where we just, we just deal with the words. Um, And uh, as always, thank you for watching. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye. Singing. <laughs>